And you go out and start taking data on the system that you uh, will use for your final project. Of course, you don't have to do that during the lab period. You can do that whenever it's convenient. But we sort of uh, use that time as kind of a formal time as a placeholder for you to do that if you're looking for time to work together. Uh, also, the TAs should be available so that if you need additional help during that period instead, like, oh, I've already taken my data, but I don't really know what to make of it. What do you think I should put in my input report? Those sorts of things. That would be another good time, good thing to use for uh, next week's lab. Um, and then the lab report for the thing that's in place of next week's lab is the input modeling report, which is that short document where the details for how it's formatted are online, but it basically is going to have about a paragraph where you sort of propose your system and then uh, some uh, data, some plots of the data that you've taken on potential inputs that you'll use in your model and some fits that you've done to sort of show us that you are on your way to being able to parameterize a model that you'll end up building. Then after that, uh, so the week after next week, that's when we'll do Lab 9. So Lab 8 has been primarily focused on the input analyzer. Lab 9 will be focused on a tool called the output analyzer, which helps you, after you've built your simulations, running multiple simulations and comparing across them. And so you won't build a model there. You might do some small modifications to some models. We'll provide some relatively complex models that would be difficult to experiment upon manually and show you how the output analyzer can automate running those experiments for you and generate data for you. And then in lab 10, uh, it is uh, sort of it covers some more advanced topics of ARENA that you haven't seen before that might be useful to you. There's a significant bonus in lab 10. There's basically like a, a lab 11 built into lab 10 that you can choose to uh, to complete that gives you, uh, you know, almost another full lab's worth of bonus points on top of that. And then that would be the last lab. Um, then so the, the, the last two weeks before your final project in those lab spaces, uh, you will just be open labs. And so you can meet with your TAs or meet with yourselves uh, or just make use of that time however you'd like. So there's not going to be a formal assignment or any formal deliverables. So it's basically all the efforts focused on making sure you have the support you need for your final project. Then the uh, final project, sort of kind of gone over all of this. The big uh, deliverable to worry about, uh, due uh, technically tomorrow, uh, although if you, uh, you know, if you turn it in a little bit late from that because you had trouble you know, scrounging up things, that's OK. But basically, they've already started to put these groups together on Canvas for those who've already uh, submitted this, uh, this thing here. So you've, uh, if you've, I think like in, I posted uh, an announcement to the 8 a.m. lab that there's about 18 people that currently haven't submitted this, and so I know that's going to be like, uh, so it'll be like three four-person groups and two three-person groups. That's the only way to make those 18 people go into that, unless some of them join um, a, uh, a group from a different section. So, uh, so I already have some idea of how many groups will be allowed. The only lab that's really constrained is, is going to be the 8 a.m. lab, although um, I, you know, don't quote me on that, uh, but, the, but it looks like right now we've got a lot of room left in the 12, 15, and the 3. So if you're really having trouble finding a fourth, if you send me an email, I might be able to tell you if we can just stick with the 3 that you have. Uh, but I may have to add a fourth later if it looks like we've got stragglers who really just couldn't find anybody. So that, you know, try to submit your names of the team members by Friday night. Uh, and then the second deliverable after that, which is about like a week, a week and a half later, is again that input model report. So you can view that as kind of the lab report for next week's non-lab. And so that's why it's about a week later. So those are the two things to worry about. And after that, the, uh, you don't have to worry about the final project until the last week of class where you do your presentations and then your final report. So um, any other questions about the final project? Yeah. No, no, so labs 9 and 10 are actually proper labs, okay. but then the lab, the, the two spots after that uh, it will actually just be open for you to work on your labs. Okay, so our labs.
Uh, I've actually, this morning, I put Lab 9 up, but I don't have a video, but I plan to actually grow the, the presentation to be a little more instructive and put a video up. Lab 10, I haven't released yet, but I'll do that soon. Any other questions about the lab? Or the go to the next slide. Yeah. Question? Wait, um, I don't know if I heard you correctly. Did you say that Lab 8 is due this Sunday or next Sunday? Lab 8, it's on a normal schedule, so since you did the lab uh, this week, then it will be due this Sunday. The thing that's due next Sunday is your input modeling report. So hopefully you see a relationship between those based on Lab 8. We gave you a bunch of data sets that we collected, and you'll do an input an uh, uh, analysis of them without kind of knowing where they came from, except for the burger joint one on that other sheet. And then next week you'll gather your own data, and, uh, and then fit your own models to it, and that's what you're submitting for your final, or your input modeling report. All right, um, other assignments. Uh, so there are these Canvas activities that have been available. Homework G3 is actually, it's been available, but it's officially posted today. It's due in two weeks, uh, so it's just two questions. The first question is on input modeling. It's a lot of the stuff that we've talked about in unit G. The second question is on output validation, which we'll see formally in lectures starting Tuesday, well, basically Tuesday and Thursday of next week, mostly Tuesday of next week. So uh, that's why you've got sort of this, this extra time here. And then the other homework, homework J2, will be released uh, after that one. Um, I'll probably release it sooner than that. You'll have another two weeks to work on that, but that's the last homework. And so this homework will be an arena assignment. You'll basically go back to that inventory modeling problem with Bucky and you'll make some modifications to that model and actually do uh, an operational question to sort of try to answer you know, how, how should we change the little s and the big s in order to, operate, uh, in order to optimize performance for that, in the, or that supply uh, problem, uh, that inventory management problem. And so that's kind of the, the outline there. This is only those two homework, the one that's currently out, the one will be out soon, and both of them will give you about two weeks to do them. So there should be plenty of time there but we should be pretty light on deliverables from here on out uh, so that you have plenty of time to think about your final projects with your groups. So, um, and then don't forget also that in the, as the syllabus mentions, that labs, uh, we have this two drop policy as well. So keep that in mind when you're sort of, you know, weighing the opportunity cost of these different assignments. All right, so uh, if no other questions, then um, so we're going to move into the more quantitative side of input modeling now. So we've been kind of marching from data collection through finding a probabilistic family and now quantitatively evaluating our choices to see if we need to go back to the drawing board. So, uh, you know, to motivate this idea of input uh, modeling, so we've got our generic process like a single server queue. We know that. Um, in a specific case, we, we say, well, okay, so in, in like 470, you might say, well, there's exponential arrivals here, there's exponential service times, so this is really just a queuing node that we describe in this so-called Kendall's notation as an MM1 queue. Those Ms, uh, that M in the first case stands for Markovian or memoryless, and that just is a, is a shorthand for saying that's an exponential, and so that works for both of those right there. And so this is just basically saying you've got a Poisson process that generates arrivals and an exponential that handles service, and that's the input models that are chosen for this node. So Kendall's notation allows us to summarize the, these two input models succinctly for a node that might show up in a queuing network. But you know there are other things we could put in there, like we could put a D for degenerate or deterministic. So we might model this service as taking always three minutes, never any variation whatsoever. In which case, they have a name for that, an MD1 queuing node, an MD1 node. Uh, or we could flip that. We could say, well, arrivals always have exactly three minutes. But once they arrive, then there's variation in how they're serving. And so that might be a D of one queue. And so, uh, the picture always stays the same, but the distributions that go inside these nodes keep changing, and that's input modeling, is figuring out those distributions, and they can get pretty exotic. So, like in this case here, this is a more advanced Kindle's notation, m to the x, ek1, and that coding means that we have uh, 
an arrival process that is exponential uh, in inter-arrival times, but batches arrive, and the number of entities in each batch are distributed uh, according to whatever distribution is encoded in this exponent up here. And so this, uh, and then EK, that's actually telling me that there's Erlang K distributed uh, service uh, times in here. And so you can get, you know, so there's, there's a lot wrapped up into this notation, but again, the thing up top stays the same. And so we wouldn't have all these different notations if they didn't matter. And there's even more of them. If you just Google for uh, Kindle's notation, you can find like just the Wikipedia page. And here's the sort of decoding of Kindle's notation. So here's all of the things you could put in the arrival process, all the things you could put in the service process. And so you can see it's, it's pretty complicated. But again, the crazy thing is the diagram you would draw in ARENA would always look like this, regardless of what choices you made here. So apparently it matters which choices you make here. You'll get very different results if you have different distributions in this box or in that box. And so input modeling is how do we choose those to make good choices. And so we've covered the data collection step, which you'll become more intimately familiar with as you move into your input modeling report. Uh, and we now, uh, you know, also last time we covered how to just sort of pick coarsely a distribution of family. Um, and now we want to say, now that we've picked a family, how do we choose parameters for that family? And then how do we evaluate our choices in terms of goodness of fit? And we'll have practice at this in Lab 8 and homework G3 and your input modeling report. And so um, are there any questions about this basic idea? Are people sort of comfortable with this idea of input modeling and what the... You know, what's, you know, inputs aren't entities anymore, they're distributions. Question? question about, like, by model distributions, and then you have to separate them into, like, different categories. Why would there be the need to do that if, like, a single distribution by itself already captures, like, the variability in the classes? Well, I guess, so I'm not quite sure I understand the point, but I think that what you're saying is sort of, like, why, why do we, like, for the arrival process, have all these different distributions that we are sort of... So, for example, like with the email detector example, uh -huh. that you oh, see how like, you right. separate it. You, like, oh, know. gotcha. So going back, so you're saying if I, have, if I could model that bimodal distribution as one distribution here, why go through the process of breaking it up into a, 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 a low mode and a high mode? Um, yeah, but like more like, um, like why would you need to like separate like one distribution for the people who have issues going through the metal detector and one distribution for the people who do not have issues? Because like, wouldn't just one distribution of people going through the metal detector already capture, you know, the people who have issues being in the, like, um, higher times and the people who do not have issues going through the lower times? Right, so that's a good question. So the question is, if I already have an empirical distribution, let's say bimodal, for this service time distribution, why would I go back like I did at the beginning of the last lecture and break it up into a decide block that sends some people off into a small service time, some people off in a large service time, if I could already put it all in one. And so sometimes it's really okay to leave it in this simplified form, but the downside of this is that this kind of hides some apparently important features of the system. And to me, I want these kind of, I want the things that parameterize these little blocks, and the reason in 470, you talk about these being queuing nodes, and they're linked together into networks, is that you kind of want the things at the nodes to be as simple as possible. And so it's ideal that you build a model so that you end up having these kind of unimodal distributions in each one of these nodes that are kind of recognizable. And it's kind of like at that point, in order for me to sort of reduce it any farther would require me knowing a lot more physics about the system. Whereas if I go from just simply, well, if I got a very clear bimodal distribution that I can reconstruct by just adding in a probability that sends them off into a high mode or a low mode, then that actually, you know, I, I want to see that structure. So it's, it's sort of what do I want to communicate to my reader and what might I accidentally be kind of overfitting if I just load all the data into here versus finding coarser models that I can manage to fit to this. And that's kind of the bigger point. This is a, a, is a little more nuanced. Part of the reason why we have each one of these distributions is that each distribution really only takes, say, one or two parameters. And so it's true that I could use an empirical distribution here, which effectively takes all of my data as a bunch of parameters and fits it into here. 
But if I could manage to find one or two distributions that are each parameterized by one or two parameters, then even if I haven't seen data in the real uh, samples, my models still have the possibility of generating those rare events that I didn't see but are consistent with the things that I did see. And so it's always better to simplify your models as much as possible and counterintuitively, making the diagram more complicated can actually make the model simpler. Because instead of saying, I have a, a general single server queue with some service time that I can only describe by drawing, I can say, no, I actually have two queues that are linked together in this particular way. And each one of them have an exponential, but the exponentials have different rates. And that actually ends up being simpler and gives us wraps our head, but allows us to better conceptualize the system. So whenever possible, break your diagrams up, but you only have to break them so far that there are, like once you get to the point where every single node in your diagrams could be parameterized as something you recognize as like one of these fundamental tools, like an exponential or a libel or whatever, you probably don't have to go any further. But if you've got multimodality, you're probably missing something that might be important to put it into the diagram. So that's what I was trying to communicate last time. All right, so, um, so like moving on from today, so now, uh, you know, we have to actually say, you know, do this quantifiable stuff. And so, you know, that, we're going to end up, you know, revisiting some of our stats. And so in order for us to really understand, like, goodness of fit, which is what we're going to here, is kind of shifts us from hypothesis testing into this new sort of thing where we actually are trying to support hypotheses. So before, it was always, how do I reject this thing? And do I have enough evidence to reject? From this point, we're trying to actually build up evidence. And we've, we've learned up to this point, statistically, it's always dangerous to make any claims if you can't reject a hypothesis. And I want to make sure that we understand that danger and understand ways in which you can mitigate that danger. So, um, I want to ask you guys, so I, mean, I want you to take 30 seconds to sort of talk about the, with, within yourselves. What is the meaning of what we mean by level of significance or type 1 error rate? And another way to say that um, is what happens to hypothesis tests when alpha is brought all the way to zero? Or the other side of that, what happens to them when alpha is brought all the way to 1? How do they behave differently when they're at these two extremes? And how does that sort of, you know, informed by our definition of this? So just try to remember what this is. Take 30 seconds to remind each other. Try to answer these questions. And I'm interested to see what you guys think. So what's a good definition? What is the level of significance, alpha? Try not to use p-value in your answer. How do you define alpha without p? Isn't it like the proportion is you can get to um, like accepting an answer? What, what, I'm sorry? Like the, the, the closest you can get? Well, well that's what, so what do we mean by closest you can get? formally define what we mean by this. It is sort of a threshold, but but what what is what is this threshold? Threshold of what? Yeah. It's like the smallest threshold that you need to reject the null hypothesis. To reject the null. So but 
Uh, so, what's, so what are the conditions there? So I hear reject and null. So we have to sort of be considering that we're in a world where the null is true. So that's the, the first thing to really understand alpha, is you have to first condition yourself in a world where the null is true. And then alpha is the, you say, for a particular test. I'm saying that if I am in a world where alpha is true, or where the null is true, alpha is the probability of rejecting that null falsely, because it's true now. So if I am in a world where it's true, and I get some data, these data, uh, this is sort of saying, like, how often do things act weird with respect to themselves? So if you're in a world where the null is true, how often is the null going to generate data that might not look like the null and cause you to reject it? So that's, you know, when you see alpha, think of that. It's like alpha is conditioned on the null being true. You know, how often do I reject it when I shouldn't have? And I shouldn't have because it's true. And so if you think about that, then you can, uh, you can go, these are some of these operating characteristics. And so you can say, well, if I bring my alpha all the way to zero, what I'm saying there is I built a test that will never, ever reject the null when it is true. How do you build a test that will guarantee alpha is equal to zero? It's a very easy test to build. What does that test look like? So by a test, I mean that I need some logic for determining when you say the null is true or false. And so, you know, that, so under, there might be some set of steps, and uh, that after you complete those steps, you then make a determination that the hypothesis, that, that the null hypothesis is either true or false. How do I guarantee, what logic do I put here to guarantee that I will never, ever, ever reject a null hypothesis when it is true? Anybody? I can wait. Yeah. Uh, well, I, it's I don't know if it's even simpler than that. Yeah. Ex well, yeah. So I wouldn't say this, but reject nothing. Yeah. So right here, this is just saying I can build a test that just rejects nothing. It it just always uh, you know it 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 always is inconclusive. And if you do that, if you never, ever, ever reject anything, you're guaranteed that your alpha of that test will be equal to zero. So on the flip side of that, how do I build a test whose alpha is equal to one? So alpha equals one means 100% of the time, when the null hypothesis is true, I reject it incorrectly. So how do I guarantee that I'm always going to make this error? How do I guarantee type one error? Reject everything, right? So this is, you could say accept or reject nothing and reject everything. And so we know that uh, the optimal test is probably somewhere in between. And for historical reasons, most of uh, the scientific disciplines have converged upon an alpha of 0.05. There is a 5% chance of rejecting a true null. In some disciplines, it's less. In some disciplines, it's more. Um, in engineering, uh, we have a different uh, relationship with type 1 error rate than we do in science. In science, you have to make an inference about real-world data. You may only get to run the experiment once. In engineering, we are more interested in detecting deviations and then investing in mining those deviations. And so for us, we are opportunistic. We're entrepreneurs. We want to find potential improvements and we're willing to invest money to do more experiments. And so for us, you might actually have an alpha that's higher than 0.05 because you just want to find anything, even if it's a false difference, because you're willing to invest a little bit more in more experiments. But if you are you know, trying to figure out um, you know, how, you know, how, uh, how much crayfish uh, can detect in terms of the light spectra when they're in mating opportunities, you might be the only one in the world who's ever going to do that experiment. You may only get the money to do it once. So in that case, you better not 
conclude something that isn't actually true, and that's why your alpha might be a little bit lower. Yeah. Given the space of alpha <coughs> equals zero or alpha equals one, why would you even have any tests anyway? Well, that's right. These are extremes, but you never get to these. But this is sort of testing our intuition is that I'm generally trying to get to the point as you reduce alpha, you are getting closer and closer to a test that will never reject anything. As you increase alpha, you are getting closer and closer to a test that will reject everything. All right, so with that in mind, we've already learned that the chi-squared critical values are a measure of deviation. So if uh, what happens to the critical values of the chi-squared if alpha gets small? Well, if I go back here, remember alpha getting small means that I reject nothing. Well, then what do I do with the critical values of the chi-squared test if I want to guarantee the chi-squared test rejects nothing? Do they go up or do they go down? Think about it, the chi-squared test, you calculate a chi-squared value, and you look in the back of the book, and you look for a critical value, and when your chi-squared value is what? Greater or below that, you reject the hypothesis. So when it's greater than the critical value is when you reject the hypothesis. So if I want to make sure that I don't ever reject anything, how do, what do I do to my chi-squared critical value? I increase them. So by increasing your chi-squared value, then you reject a lot fewer hypotheses, and that's, and that's why, if you look in the back of the book, as the alpha gets smaller, the critical values get larger. You are allowing for more and more deviation. And by allowing for more deviation, you're rejecting less and less, until eventually you allow for 100% for as much deviation as possible, and you still don't reject. So this alpha is our generic stance on how much we can deviate from a null and still be okay with it. And then as we go in and build these tests, then we have these more concrete stances. And so in the chi-squared case, if I want a small alpha, I need a very, very high chi-squared. Or like, same thing with a KS test. If I want a small alpha, I need a very, very high D star. You know, I need a very, very high uh, KS critical value. And the flip side is true too. If I want alpha to get very, very large, I'm rejecting everything. So my chi-squared will go down to zero. And once chi-squared is equal to zero, once the chi-squared critical value is equal to zero, I don't even have to run the chi-squared test because I know I'm going to get some value that's greater than zero, and it's going to be rejected by the chi-squared test. So that's sort of where I want you to be in your conceptualization of this, is, that, is to think about these extremes and to think about how they translate to these critical values and what that means realistically. And so... Um, that finally we get to these sort of p-values. And so I might skip these and then try to jump uh, you know, directly to this example here. So let's think about this example. Let's say I had a coin. I don't have a coin on me, but you know, once, once upon a time people carried coins with them, and uh, I could get this out and flip a coin. I could flip it twice, and it might come up heads twice in a row. And so I'm interested in that. like, heads twice in a row, is this a fair coin? I just ran an experiment, and it came out heads twice. And so I, want, so I want to evaluate two hypotheses. Now, this is a goodness of fit test. And so I am less interested in rejecting a null and more interested in finding evidence to support one of these two models. These are models, really. And in one model, I have a fair coin. In the other model, I have a biased coin that only comes up heads. Now, the weird thing here is if I run a binomial test, so play, if you remember these things from like 380, you can run this thing. It's, it's uh, you know, a binomial test is basically I put in a hypothetical uh, weight of the coin, in this case the fair coin, so 50% probability, and it gives me a p-value corresponding to that null. So the null here is a 50% probability, the null here is 100% probability of heads. And the p-value corresponding to this, this equal probability comes out to 0.5. Now that's greater than 0.05, so I'm not rejecting that hypothesis. But then I calculate the binomial uh, p-value for the hypothesis that it's a biased coin that only comes up heads. And my p-value is one. So now I have a much higher p-value for this hypothesis. But this seems weird to me because I'm pretty sure that if I did have a coin, I flipped it twice, this would not be a weird outcome. And this p-value kind of tells me that it wouldn't be a weird outcome, that those data are very consistent with this hypothesis. 
Now, if I blindly look at p-values, I might want to choose this hypothesis here. But my intuition tells me that it's probably jumping the gun to saying that this is a biased coin just based on two. So what's going on here? What's wrong with my experiment that is not allowing me to properly discriminate with these two leaves over here? Take 15 seconds or so and talk to your neighbors and figure out what's wrong with the experiment that I designed. I flipped the coin twice, and it came up heads both times, and I just do not trust the outcome here that this is the best. So what did I do wrong if we assume that I'm correct that my test is somehow broken? What do I... What, how do I need to redo my test in order to better discriminate between these two hypotheses? Go ahead and chat with your neighbor. <laughs> somebody were to tell you that they had an unfair coin because it came up heads twice, what would be your criticism of their logic? I need to do it more times. So that's the answer I'm looking for here. If you have very little data, your p-values are always going to be high. Because a p-value says, based on this null and these data you gave me, what's the chance that you could have gotten this outcome? But it's possible to get two heads a lot of the time. But so if I have very little data, I can't really trust p-values unless they're below that alpha level. If they're above alpha with little <coughs> data, I can't trust this. If I were to continue to do this and flip the coin a lot of times, then maybe I could trust this again. So this is a question of what we'll talk about as statistical power, which is related to beta, which we'll get into a lot more on Tuesday of next week. Now, Based on that idea, let's say I did go and, and change my experiment. Now I flipped it 200 times, and under 200 times, it comes up heads 90 of those 200 times. I calculate uh, for a fair coin, the p-value is 0.17. That's above alpha, so I'm not going to reject the hypothesis of a fair coin, which I didn't expect it because I think this is very reasonable. Flip it 200 times, yeah, it could come up 90. Why not? But if I flip it 2,000 times and it comes up 900 times, same proportion under the above, I can now calculate the binomial p-value, and it is way less than 0.05. So what went wrong? This seems to me like a very reasonable uh, outcome for a fair coin. But the thing is, that's the other side of p-values, is that as you increase the amount of data you have, you increase the discrimination ability of your statistical tests. My coin might not be fair, but maybe it comes up 51% of the time heads and not 50% heads. That's effectively fair. So if I just needed to flip a coin, you know, for, to make a couple of decisions, and I didn't have to do it that often, I'm not really stacking the deck against anybody. That's pretty much a fair coin. But if I'm flipping it 2,000 times, I can now detect that it's not fair. And so this is one of the problems with gathering more data and using these low sample statistics, like things that involve p-values, t-tests, binomial tests, things like that. The more data you get, the smaller effect sizes they will detect, and your p-values are guaranteed to plummet to below your significance level. And then you really need to ask yourself, is this a meaningful effect? And not, is there an effect? This question is, is there effect? And it says, I can't tell a difference between this and a fair coin. There might be a difference, but I can't tell. This one says, aha, I, I could find a difference. In fact, for 2,000 samples, I can find a really, really tiny difference. But the difference you find, even though you conclusively find a difference from a fair coin, might not be meaningful. So we need to be really careful when interpreting our p-values, especially when it comes to how many samples we've collected. And so that's kind of the thing I want to sort of marinate in as we go forward with this, 
is that large p-values are only meaningful if there is enough data. And we'll need to define what we mean by enough in part two of homework G3 is it helps you, it was one example of how we do that, and we'll go into that more in depth on Tuesday. And then you can always lower the p-value by taking more data. And this is the big reason why things like t-tests are not used by these big data folks. So if you're going out and taking social media uh, data, and you want to tell, is there a difference between you know, men and women on their opinion towards whatever you asked on the survey, and you surveyed three billion people, then of course you're going to find a difference between men and women. But the question is, like, is the, you know, if it's a difference between 50.1 and 49.9, maybe that's not actually a marketable difference that you can act on. So as you go up into big data, that's why you really need these linear models. And that's what, in your more advanced statistical courses, you'll shift totally away from hypothesis testing and start to embrace generalized linear modeling. And so that's outside of the scope of this course, but you should keep that in mind as you move on with this. You do more and more industrial stats, you're going to switch away from this and more into this because you're going to get access to more and more data. All right. So last uh, example I want to give you, especially going into, you know, now we have playoffs and various sports coming up. And I love these sporting people really love seven game playoffs, right? You know, seven, it sounds really good. Best of seven, that's conclusive, right? Well, let's think about that statistically. We have two teams, A and B. We have a null hypothesis that they're equally matched. And that's what we want to reject. And we want to tell who's better than who. And so the null hypothesis is the probability of winning of 0.5. If the probability of winning is greater than 0.5, we conclude that A is the better team. If the probability of winning is less than 0.5, B is the better team. And so we run an experiment. And that experiment is a seven game long experiment. And that experiment comes out with six wins and a loss. And that seems decisive. That seems like team A is the better team. But according to a binomial test, with this null hypothesis of 50% probability, that I get a p-value of 12.5%. That's still greater than my 5% significance level. So based on conventional statistics, this is not decisive. I can't tell the difference between this and an outcome that could occur if they were equally matched. So then I say, all right, well then what do I need to be decisive? Turns out I need seven wins to go below my 5% significance level. I need seven wins in a row. But the thing is, in any seven-game tournament, they're not going to let you watch seven wins. The most wins they'll let you watch is four. So then the question is, well, how about four? Well, if I get four games and four wins, which is a boring series to me, then I actually get a p-value of 12.5%, which is approaching significance, but it's still not quite there. Now, what if uh, it's five uh, games with four wins? Well, it turns out my p-value just keeps going up. At the point where I get to the most exciting series, where I have seven games, so four wins and three losses, then in those cases, my p-value reaches 54%. So you've spent potentially seven weeks of your life watching this series, or maybe three weeks or two weeks, but in, in the end, the outcome is no better than that fair coin flip. And so this is a great way to get you to watch advertising and not actually end up providing you a statistically meaningful result. But in order for us to do statistically meaningful baseball or whatever you want it to be, you'd actually have to run a lot more experiments when teams were pretty much equally matched, as they often will be at the point where they're playing in these very, very critical games. And that might mean watching 100 games. Who wants to watch 100 baseball games for the same two teams? Not me. Um, so, so this is sort of a, a way to sort of think about, like, you know, whenever you see these, these ad hoc experiments that people in sports run, what are they actually concluding with these? And what does it say about us that we watch these things? You know, like, we really like just watching coin flips. Um, now, that also goes for voting. You know, it's like every time you see a result where it comes out that the popular vote, uh, or what doesn't even matter, the whole electoral college or popular vote thing. We'll talk about bias later in the class. But, but, uh, but, if, you, uh, but if you just come out to say, well, you got 51% for one candidate and 49% for the other, and you immediately say, ah, candidate one win or one, if we actually do a statistical analysis, when things are that close, we very often have too small of a sample size. 
And we really need to get more people voting in order to reduce our confidence intervals so that we can make that, uh, that determination. And so as things get more exciting, we actually need to play more games. We need to vote more. As things get less exciting, then we can sort of do less. So that's you know, things to think about as we move forward with these things. So in general, the, the elements of a hypothesis testing, we need an alpha, a type 1 error rate, but we also need that beta, which has to do with the statistical power, which is the minimum acceptable probability of rejecting a false null. So if we're in a world where the null is wrong, then we might uh, reject a, so we, we want to sort of say we like to reject a null that's actually wrong, but sometimes we're going to accept it. And so there's this beta term, one minus beta, that we call statistical power, and we need both of those together. And so with both of those, we can then determine how many samples we need, how long to run the experiment, how many replications of the simulation to run, and so on Tuesday, we'll go into how to actually calculate this. But given your alpha, your beta, and your uh, particular test, and how much variance is in your data, only then can you determine how many simulation replications, how many games, how many voters you need in order to actually be able to detect the difference that you think is meaningful. So that's where we're going. Um, and then there are a bunch of out there. So Again, you take more stats, you'll learn other alternatives like Bayesian stats, but again, that's not something we really touch on in this course. Question? Yeah, going back real quick, like the second point of the low alpha, is that the definition or the second element? Uh, the statistical power? The, well, below alpha. Al, well, uh -huh, yeah, right. well, these are two elements. Okay. So alpha, the definition there is the maximum simple probability of rejecting a true null, and then the other essential element is the possibility that a false null might not be rejected. So I need both alpha and beta when I'm considering my hypothesis test. And so hopefully by the end of next week, you'll have a very good handle on what those two terms are, and whenever and you'll know when to ask for more so-called statistical power. All right. OK, so uh, where we've gone so far, uh, we've done our QQ plots, our PP plots, the fat pencil test, and all of that. Um, and so, but now we want to make it more quantitative. And so how do we choose parameters for these things and then evaluate our choices? So uh, the, once you've got, like you said, oh, I want a binomial, well, there are certain parameters I need to choose for that binomial. And sometimes they'll have physical meaning, like how many trials, how many games, and what's the probability of each trial coming up one or zero. And sometimes they have less physical meaning, but more just shape meaning. So what is the range of the uniform distribution? Where is the mode of the triangle? Where is the mean of the, of the uh, normal? Um, you know, how in, a, in the beta, uh, this beta distribution, which is a really useful distribution when you have continuous variables that are bounded, there are these alpha and beta parameters which have no easy way to describe what they do, but they give you two degrees of freedom to change the shape to be about anything you want within a bounded range. And so we have these two types of parameters. We have to fit them together. And so of these shape parameters, we're often going to use the term location and scale. So a location parameter is like a generalized mean. It represents uh, sort of the location a, a distribution is sitting. And so in a family of, of uh, distributions that have a location parameter, and that means that I can take one of them and change its location parameter and turn it into the other. And a, a family that has a scale parameter is how you can take a distribution and stretch it or tighten it. And a family that has a scale parameter is one where if I take one member of those family and change its scale parameter, it turns into another member of the family. And so we sometimes we use the term scale it's the, uh, just the reciprocal of the term rate. So I've often talked about the exponential rate. Well, if I were talking about the exponential scale, then that would just be one over that rate. In the case of an exponential, the scale is actually just its mean. And so the exponential is kind of weird in that it only has a single parameter. All other parameters, we just group into something called shape. So as an example, um, so the normal distribution is a popular one, but there it fits into a wider family of distributions that we call the location scale family. So saying the location scale family means that we have a distribution 
that has two parameters, one of them specifying its location. In the case of the normal, it's a mean. The other one is scale. In the case of the normal, it's the standard deviation. And if you were to change those parameters, you would just get another member of the location scale family. And so sometimes when we're writing proofs, like when will this policy work? Will you say, well, this policy will work so long as the demand comes from a location scale distribution. So that's sort of a, something that we'll end up saying. Um, and then again, the rate and scale, I already gave that explanation there. So those are some terminology that we use. Now, um, before we go into how to estimate these, we often first need to estimate these descriptive statistics. And so sample mean and sample variance. Now everybody here knows how to calculate an arithmetic mean. Now the reason I put this up there is that hopefully you remember from 380 and maybe 385 that when you calculate sample variance, you have to divide not by n, but by n minus 1. And so this is the so-called degrees of freedom of this variance. And I bring this up also because when we go to the chi-squared, we also have to talk about degrees of freedom, and it's very much related to this. So whenever we measure a variation, we have to ask, how did that variation happen? And in the case of estimating variance, when the mean is also estimated, knowing the mean basically takes away one of your data points. And so, in other words, if I know the mean, and I know n minus 1 of my data points, I know the nth data point as well because I couldn't have gotten that mean and the n minus 1 data points with some arbitrary nth data point. So knowing one allows me to solve for the other. So the variation that I see here is not actually being contributed to by n independent samples. It's being contributed to by n minus 1 samples. And if you don't divide by n minus 1, you get a biased estimate of variance. You can take this all the way down to imagine I only have one sample. Well, if I have one sample, then I can estimate the mean, and it's just equal to that one sample. But if I try to estimate the variance, then that um, one sample is actually, if this were, in other words, divided by n or divided by 1, I would actually get a finite variance. So that doesn't make any sense. I took one sample. How could I possibly estimate my variance to be finite if I've only had one sample? And so it shows that by dividing by n, you bias your estimate of a variance. And that's why you have to divide by n minus 1. It's to account for the degree of freedom you've lost by estimating your mean from the data. You effectively lose a data point whenever you use that to estimate this. And that goes for not only continuous random variables, but discrete. So when you calculate discrete random variables, you've got frequencies that add up to your total number of observations. And so the mean that you get is going to be the frequency of an observation times the observation summed over all the observations. And the variances here, again, are divided by n minus 1. And there are these handy formulas down here that allow you to quickly calculate sample variance without having to calculate all of these differences. And then finally, if I give you a histogram, that histogram is a effectively lost data. So I could have given you a continuous distribution, all the data points, but it was easier to summarize as a histogram. The downside is, is now you only have these 10 bins. It started out with 1,000 points, now you only have 10 points. You have 10 bin centers and 10 bin frequencies. And that effectively turns a continuous variable into a discrete variable. And so to calculate the mean, it's just the frequency times the midpoint of the bin. To calculate the variance, again, it's the same as the, the discrete case, but you use the midpoint of the bin here. And again, there's this handy formula. And so, you know, it's just mainly me driving in that when you're, when you're calculating this, remember to use n minus 1. That'll come up a lot. So an example, I've got Poisson distributed data here. There's a histogram of it. And so I calculate, um, there are these, again, these formulas. So this was one of those sample formulas that quickly calculate estimated variance. I just have to know uh, this, this sum here and this sum here. And if I know those two sums, I put them together in this way, and I can get an estimated variance and an estimated mean. So nothing special there. But what I want to point out to you is that the Poisson should have the same mean as its variance. So if you look up the definition of a Poisson, the alpha parameter sets both the mean and the variance. But if you estimate these things, they're often going to be different. 
And so we have to also keep in mind that we're just taking point estimates, and they're almost never going to be dead on what we expect them to be. And so they, a, a better approach would be to use confidence intervals, which we're going to introduce when we start analyzing our output data in lecture J1. But it's just something to keep in mind that whenever you take point estimates, don't expect these to match your assumptions from the theory because they're just estimates from the data. And it would just be, there's enough degrees of freedom that allows this variance estimate to stray away from a mean estimate. When in reality, the actual mean and the actual variance are probably somewhere in between those two. So any questions about, I mean, hopefully you guys have done a lot of means and variances. But any questions about this n minus 1? Is this weird to anybody? Hopefully you've seen this before plenty of times. All right, good. So um, then the question, so summary statistics are great, but what do we do with all of these parameters here that aren't necessarily related to the mean and variance? How do we estimate them? How do we generate point estimates of distributional parameters? And so uh, our motivation here, and again, you hopefully should have done this in 380 or maybe 385, is maximum likelihood estimation is a common way to deal with this. And the idea is if I know, if I have a model of my distribution, I have its PMF or I have its PDF, and I have taken data. And so the idea is, that, so a PMF effectively says if you know the parameters, here's the distribution of samples you might get. Now a likelihood function uses the same PMF or PDF, but it goes in reverse. It's saying, given the data, what are the distribution of parameters that could have generated these data? And so that's why we have these two different terms, likelihood and probability. They are not identical. You should only use the word likelihood if you mean I've taken data and I'm trying to figure out what parameter is best. You should only use the term probability if you say I know what parameters are out there and I'm trying to predict what data could come out. And so the idea here is I want to try to optimize my parameters to match what I get from my data, which I've already sampled and is fixed. So I can do this really simply for an exponential. This is kind of an easy example here. So I have an exponential. It has a PDF up here. It has a CDF up here. It has a single parameter. I've taken, let's say, 20 data points, and I want to figure out what's the best parameter for this lambda. And so... Again, going back to 380, I know that I took my 20 data points, and technically, I need a joint PDF. So I need the argument to be all 20 of those. But I'm going to make the assumption that each sample was independent of the previous sample. And in that case, a joint PDF is just the product of all of the marginal PDFs, all of the individual ones. And so that allows me to take this expression here, combine it with this, and then I get a very simple expression for the joint PDF. And this is something that has a lambda that just shows up once. And so I can take the partial derivative of that thing and set it equal to zero. So that's all I've done. I've taken a partial derivative of that, and I get this expression. The stuff here on the left, there's no way that would ever equal zero. So really, I'm just setting this thing in parentheses equal to zero. And if you see, you can kind of see it here. If I set that equal to zero, I'm going to end up moving things around. And what then my ultimate answer will be is this lambda hat is just one over the sample mean. So it happened to come out that, that the sample mean popped out in my maximum likelihood estimator. And it kind of makes sense. But this won't always be the case. So that's why we can't just rest on our descriptive statistics. So even though you've taken a descriptive statistic and you said, this is the best estimator of the mean, it is a wrong approach to just go and say, well, what is the mean of this variable? I'm going to just match things up so that these means match. This approach here actually takes the whole distribution into account and says, for the whole distribution, what's the maximum likelihood I get for these data? And it just happened to be, conveniently, that the means match up this way. And so, but again, I don't want you to generalize that lesson. I want you to generalize this approach of taking the partials, set them equal to zero, and solving for these maximum likelihoods. And so if you go into the book, they actually have, they've done this for a number of different examples, Poisson exponential, normal, log normal, and a bunch more. I put the ones up here that are simple to summarize, but if you look at the bunch more that are in this table in the book, you'll see what I mean, but the maximum likelihood estimator may not have any real relationship 
to these descriptive statistics that you've taken. Uh, it just so happens that for these, they have a nice, tidy relationship. So any questions about maximum likelihood estimation? You feel like you could do that if you had to. All right. All right, so let's get into the goodness of fit. So right now, we've gotten to the point where we've, we've now come up with a good parameter. And now we want to take that parameter and the distribution together and ask, is this a good fitting distribution to these data? So just because I picked the best parameter doesn't mean it's a good fit. This is like this is like the worst. This right here could be the worst or the best of the worst worlds. Uh, these might be terrible choices, but for these terrible family choices, then these are the best parameters subject to forcing myself into these choices. So goodness of fit goes the next step, and it's saying, let's combine these two, your exponential choice and your rate estimate together, and see how well you did in fitting the data. And so that's what we need to calculate. And so goodness of fit tests are going to be used in your input modeling to evaluate your choice of a distribution, and also an output validation. What I mean by this is you're going to run your SIMs, it's going to generate data, and then you're going to compare that data to output data you took from the real system and see how well those fit. And so there's a question in the part one of homework G3 where it asks you to compare two things, like why would you use one thing over another? And, and I want you to keep this slide in mind when you try to answer that question, is that one of those scenarios I'm claiming will correspond more to one of these things, and the other scenarios in that problem correspond to the other of those things. And I want you to make that connection and see that in some scenarios, you'll use one scenario, in other scenarios, you'll use another. And so question, that first question is effectively testing you on both of these things, even though you're still using the same goodness of fit test. So I'm just letting this sit here, because I'll get a lot of questions about that part one. And people say, I don't really understand what you mean by when would you uh, use part A versus part B. This is the slide you should refer to. Okay. So the correct distributions um, it's hard to say what correct means. So, the, uh, the, so I say they're kind of elusive or non-existent. And I hope the examples that I tried to motivate back in the stats with you um, show that. So if I have very little data, my p-values are going to be gigantic. It doesn't matter what my hypothesis is. If I, have, if I have very little data, I do not have enough evidence to reject anything. So I reject nothing. If I have too much data, my p-values are all going to be very small which means that I'm detecting really, really small effects. And I might not care about those really, really small effects. So then everything is rejected. So there is a danger in depending too much on p-values. And so I need to sort of figure out ways in which I can fit models where the p-values are informative, but maybe not you know, ruling my entire problem. So um, you know, we'll, now we're sort of revisiting the goodness of fit tests we've already used. And so this, uh, you know, before we already, before the midterm, we used a goodness of fit test to test for uniformity. And, uh, and I remember showing this slide, but I had a slightly different prediction up here because it was adjusted for uniformity. And I said, what test should you immediately think of when someone says you're going to you're going to compare one set of counts to another set of counts? Whenever you hear the word count, count, you should think of this test. And that test is the chi-squared test. So a chi-squared test is a test that has been designed to compare counts. And we are now generalizing it from a uniform case to uh, non-uniform cases as well. So the chi-squared statistic is just comparing observed counts and expected counts. And in lecture I, we'll talk about more about where this formula comes from. But the uh, big thing that I need you to take from this is if your expected counts are less than five, as they will be in that part one of your homework G3, you need to combine adjacent classes until the expected counts become five or more. In some other classes, you might have learned that it's a different threshold. Uh, I'm going with five. That's generally what's kind of preferred in the scientific literature. It's what's preferred in your book. So even if you've heard three or whatever, um, you really, in order to really push this to three, you need to apply something called a continuity correction. And we usually don't cover that in undergraduate level courses. And so five is really the, the conservative choice. So that's what we're using five. If you've got an expected count less than five, stop, combine classes before moving on. 
And the critical value you should conceptualize is the maximum allowable deviation under the hypothesis of the null. And so it has a certain number of degrees of freedom, and that degree of freedom is reduced by your number of classes as well as the number of parameters estimated from data. And this, again, is for the same reason why we use n minus 1 when estimating variance. So in the degrees of freedom calculation, because all of our observations add up to n, we lose one degree of freedom off the bat. Like, we just immediately have, because we know there's n data points, once you know n minus 1 counts, you immediately know the other counts because it has to add up to n. And that's why the chi-squared starts at n minus 1 degrees of freedom, because that variation in that last class, in that last bin, doesn't matter. Because once you know the other three, you know that one. So that's why it starts at n minus 1. But if you've gone further and you've estimated a parameter from data, so for example, you might have calculated the mean of a normal distribution by calculating the arithmetic mean from data. Well, look, this too is a constraint just like this constraint, where if I know the mean, I effectively throw away one bit of data. Because if I know every other sample and the mean, I know what this one's going to be because I can solve for it. So every time you estimate a parameter, you throw away a degree of variation. And that's why the degrees of variation for a chi-squared start within minus 1, and then they subtract 1 for every estimated parameter. And that will be a key difference in that homework G3, is that in one of them you'll estimate a parameter, another one you won't. And so you'll have to make sure you change this parameter. And so if your degrees of freedom goes all the way to zero, what that basically means is that you have, you've estimated so many parameters, you've basically taken all of your data and encoded them into your parameters. And so having a degree of freedom equal to zero is like going to set your chi-squared value, your chi-squared critical value equal to zero. So in other words, if I have encoded all of my data as parameters, there better not be any difference in the expectation because I basically just transformed one, you know, data from one point into parameters another point, but they have the same amount of variation, and so I shouldn't expect the observed and expected to be different. And that's why we sort of always want these degrees of freedom to be as high as possible. As they get lower, 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 then our test is going to get harder and harder and harder to meet. So um, as examples of this, so if I've got a normally distributed uh, hypothesis, but I fit... Uh, but I end up choosing, a, for my mean and standard deviation, the sample mean and sample standard deviation, then I need to make my degrees of freedom in the chi-squared test n minus 1 minus 2, or n minus 3, because I estimated two parameters. But instead, I might have said that, well, I'm not, I don't actually care about the normal distribution in general. I care about one particular normal. And so this is like, you know, somebody said that the output needs, in order for your simulation to be correct, it needs to generate data that are normally distributed with a mean of 5 and a standard deviation or a variance of 2. Now at that point, these are not estimated from data. So when I do the chi-squared for this test, the degrees of freedom are only n minus 1. So I only penalize when I estimate. So these look very similar. They're both testing a normal distribution, but I estimated parameters here and I didn't here. So that's why I got the extra penalty. And then I've got other uh, examples here where if you, sometimes it's confusing because if you have parameters that are not estimated from data, they don't penalize. So as an example, if I'm testing against the uniform distribution, my a and B, the outside of the ranges, aren't estimated from data, even though I might have sort of estimated them from data. I didn't arithmetically estimate them. There's no constraint that they now have to lie on. But for like a triangular distribution, the mode I do more tightly estimate from data. So if I'm fitting, if I'm testing a triangular distribution, I have a penalty of one, but if I'm testing, but only for that mode, not for the outside of the range. So, are there any question about choosing your degrees of freedom for the time squared test? Be a little murky deciding which one's estimated and which one's not. All right. So, this is the example I gave before the midterm for testing for uniformity. And so, give a bunch of data, 
choose four classes to put those data into. I count how many data points fall into each of the four classes. And for a uniform hypothesis, the expected number that falls into each class is just n times 1 over n, because 1 over n is the probability that I get if I were to integrate under this whole interval here. And so then I end up saying it should be 7.5 in each one of those. Now, 7.5 is greater than 5, so I'm allowed to continue. So then I calculate my chi-squared statistic. I compare the chi-squared statistic to the table. It's greater than the maximum allowable difference, and so I reject uniformity. So the question is here, then, what do I do when I don't, I'm not just testing for uniformity, I'm testing for triangularity or something like that. Well, in that case, I have to calculate the probability that my samples could have fall, fell in that interval and then multiply that by the total number of samples, and then the test is identical. And so for a discrete random variable, you just add up all of the outcomes that land in that interval, and that gives you that probability. For a continuous random variable, I take the integral under the density function um, just for that interval, and that gives me that probability. If I've given you the CDF, then I, you can end up just subtracting, so for a continuous one here, you can just subtract the, the boundaries of the interval. So if you want to know what's the probability that a certain number of points fall between 2 and 3, I just take the CDF evaluated at 3 minus the CDF evaluated at 2. As an example of that, um, imagine I want to test for uh, an exponential distribution. I've been given a certain amount of data. N observations have been binned into 10 intervals. Now, um, as a quick check, um, how many people say the number of degrees of freedom for this test should be 10? How many people say it should be 9? How many people say it should be 8? Uh, I see like one hand, so I'm going to go back. How many people say 9? How many people say 10? 9? It's fine. Okay, so, um, so the idea here is that I made two years part of the hypothesis. It is not estimated from data. So the right answer here is 9, because it's 10 bins minus 1. I didn't estimate anything from data, so I don't do any more penalizing. If I would have left this part out, and I had to estimate these from my data, then I'd be one more penalty in the rules of data. Question? So bottom line, Uh, you, well, you, you, it's how many things you estimate. If you estimate 10 parameters, then there should be a, then you do n minus 1 minus 10. So it's however many parameters you estimate. I only, would, here I estimated no parameters, but if I would have estimated this parameter, that would have been one parameter. If I estimated two parameters, it would be an additional two. So it's going to be n minus 1 minus however many parameters you estimate. Then I go on, and I've given you the PDF and the CDF, and so in order for me to figure out how many sit in this bin, this 2, 3 bin here, then I could take the integral underneath the PDF between 2 and 3, or since I've given you the CDF, I just evaluate the CDF at 3, I evaluate the CDF at 2, and I get about 14.5%. Multiply 14.5 by whatever the number of observations were, and that gives me my expected number. And then I can just go back and do exactly what I did over here. So that's the chi-squared test. The um, other modification that we'll do to the test we've seen before is, is just like before the midterm, if the expected number is less than 5, then we can't use the chi-squared. Now, it might be that you've clustered a lot of your things together, but if I end up getting um, uh, degrees of freedom that, like, if I've eaten up all of my degrees of freedom by bringing everything together, they're not going to be able to discriminate. So, effectively, everything's going to look like a uniform distribution. So, what other tests do I use? And just like before the midterm, we used a Kolmogorov Smirnov test, which ordered all the data and studied their quantiles. And that's what we'll do here, but we make one tiny modification and then we do everything just like we did before the midterm. So the idea here is, uh, so the Kolmogorov smirnov test is a one-sample test which compares between the data and a reference, or a two-sample if we want to test between two different types of data. And, uh, and it's useful when small sample sizes and we have no parameters estimated from data. In the scope of this class, if you've estimated a parameter, you pretty much are going to have to use the chi-square. In the future, there are options for this. And the idea here is I sort my data. I plot its empirical CDF like we did before the midterm. I plot a reference CDF like we did before the midterm, and I measure the difference.
Before the midterm, we only worked with uniforms, and so you did this table on a homework. All we do now is we replace the middle row, and we don't put the data there anymore. We put the CDF of the data. So, but otherwise, it's identical. So you just take your data points, sort them, and then pipe them into the CDF. And that will give you numbers between 0 and 1, which will also be sorted. And then just do the exact same test that you did before the midterm. So it's a minor modification, but it allows this test to test for things other than uniform. Um, and so, the, there again, estimated parameters, it's really difficult to deal with estimated parameters. You have to look up for special purpose modifications in the KS test whenever your parameters are estimated. Any questions about the difference between the KS and the, and the pre-midterm and post-midterm KS or chi-squared? The only other thing that I want to leave you with today is there's two other tests that in modern statistical tools you might see instead of these tests or alongside of them. And the big difference is statistical power. The KS test has largely been supplanted by the Anderson-Darling test, AD. And the Anderson-Darling test works very similar to the KS test, but it changes some of the math behind the scenes to give it more statistical power. And what that means by more statistical power is that I can actually sort of generate more discrimination ability from less data. And so that's one of the reasons why you like the Anderson-Darling test. The other way to view it is if you're looking for support for a hypothesis, you need statistical power to conclude anything about high p-values. So if you get a high p-value and you want to use that as evidence for using a distribution, then the better the statistical power test, the, then the better your conclusion. And Anderson-Darling is better than KS. If you are specifically testing for normality, the very best thing you can do for testing for normality is the so-called Shapiro-Wilk test. You'll find that in a lot of statistical tools. It is even more powerful than here. So whenever you say, like, ah, I can only use this statistical approach if I can guarantee my data are normal, how do I build evidence that my data are normal? Well, you do your QQ plot, and once it passes that, then you do a Shapiro-Wilk. And if you get a p-value greater than your alpha with Shapiro-Wilk, because it is so powerful, then you can conclude that we've accepted the hypothesis of normality. Whereas maybe with the Anderson-Darling, with the KS, with the chi-squared, if the p-value is greater than alpha, you can't really say anything. So, so, that's, so that's kind of you know, the summary here. We've kind of got over all of this stuff. Um, lab 8, the input analyzer down here in this, uh, you should be pretty familiar with this now. You know it will generate chi-squared and KS for you. So you don't have to actually do these numerical results yourself. Um, three, um, so, but then, you know, so remember the Shapiro-Wilk stuff, remember the Anderson-Darling, but I'm only going to ask you to do the calculations for KS and chi-squared in this class. Um, so uh, otherwise, if there's any questions, you can come up and talk to me after. Um, for the attendance question, then um, let's say, let's see how much you remember from the last minute. What test should you use specifically for the case of testing for normality. If you're looking for evidence in favor of normality, what test should you use? And it is not a test you'll ever have to calculate in this class, but it will show up in your statistical tools and you should recognize it when you see it. it starts with an S. It's a hyphenated name like all the others. <laughs> 